life is pretty good. So um, I feel very blessed, number one, I'm healthy. Um, and this third act uh, sort of endeavor came out of that. And, you know, from the recovery period, I finally said, well, let's just make this something good. Take the third act, what I call the good conversation we started last year and move it into some meaningful sort of difference for people that are, I say, walking the talk every day. They're really out there in our communities, helping the unfortunate that uh, either don't have food, don't have uh, housing, clothing, the whole bit. We're talking about the lowest of the low that fall under the cracks of the big organization. So, Hello, my name is Clay Boykin, and I am in search of the new Compassionate Mail. Today, I have the honor of having with me Roger Steed. Roger has an incredible program, and I was going to read through and summarize it all and so forth, but I said, the heck with that. I want to hear it from Roger. <laughs> so, hi, Roger. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So, first of all, this is a very interesting name. The program is called Third Act. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I can. It's... um. Uh, as I say, I'll give you the five minute version and you can expound if you wish. But um, I had COVID last March um, and I was pretty ill for two weeks and then obviously got better. But the key out of that whole event, besides the illness, which was not fun, was uh, because of precautionary reasons, I was basically living in my bedroom for mm -hmm. a month and a half. My wife and daughter who live in the same house, you know, we were all very protective. This was early days in the COVID sort of pandemic and everyone was uh, not sure about how long to, you know, yeah. stay, stay away from each other. And so it was kind of kind of funny and humorous in some ways. They'd leave meals on my dresser and then all then I would go back and this is after I was uh, obviously on the mend and I would, um, yeah. I could work there. I had a TV, I had my computer. And so uh, once I started feeling better, I basically had this time on my hands, which was the biggest thing in my head, to be honest. I mean, you know, I, I'm a morning person. So I get up at five 30 and then the market started and I'd be doing my investing thing for my clients. And then I had all this time to just, think and so you know it uh you know a lot of things sort of mm -hmm. came together i guess from the standpoint of a uh, reassessment of my life as well as yeah. this illness i just been through and what it means if it meant anything and what i was going to do about it was this going to roll with the punches and go back to work and go you know back playing golf and stuff with my buddies or what so that was sort of the the sort of the kickoff if you will and then from um, the March period, as I got better and started uh, circulating again with my friends, I started walking with a neighbor who's a close friend and he's a good listener. And uh, he and a couple of the, my family members and close friends, they would uh, hear my conversations about, you know, what this all meant and trying to hone in on a meaning for it. And I kind of finally came to a conclusion it had a bigger meaning instead of just, you know, getting through it and going on with what I was doing, which was in some instances, very fine. I thought there's a bigger, bigger meaning to it. And I mm -hmm. took it back all the way to um, my college days when I was um, a freshman and we were in a fraternity at, at Oklahoma and we had this uh, pledge class outing where you escape from the membership for a weekend and, and have a good time. And so we went up to a big lake in Oklahoma and um, having a good time, you know, has, freshman guys do. <laughs> you know, yes, I do. <laughs> so we had a great time and uh, uh, life was good. And so long story short, the host of that uh, whole event of, of Pledge Brother um, got some guys rallied up late at night. I'm talking about two in the morning after I'd only already gone to bed mm -hmm. and said, let's go. We're going to go out in the boat. So he gets his boat out of the uh, storage and you know it's one of those where he just uh, slips it out and goes but it was one of these speed boats um so i just sleepily said okay so one of my buddies and so on. so we we get in the boat and i'm sitting behind the driver um the host and so he takes off look at these split i mean mm. just going crazy at uh, night at night at night very low light 
And long story short, he hits a uh, pylon, a telephone pole basically in the water, and it splits the boat in half and it hits him in the head and uh, basically kills him. And it, it ricochets off me because I'm behind him and ricochets off me. And so he's in bad shape. I'm a little bit better, but uh, somehow we get to shore and long story short, I was taken to Tulsa, Tulsa, I was in ICU for a week and blah, blah, blah. So they had to uh, do a little reconstruction of my skull, not my brain, my, my skull. And so from that, that was yeah. a big sort of traumatic um, moment. And so mm. I survived that, you know, went back to school, life was good, graduated, went into the banking business and was doing my thing. And um, somehow over time, I kept having this nagging feeling. Um, I'm a, why did I survive? And my pledge brother died. And, and yeah. how do I absorb this and go on with this? I never really came to grips with it, to be honest. Right. So um, uh, one aspect of this, I've kind of decided after years of thinking about it, mm -hmm. is that I kind of wanted to keep getting away from Oklahoma, my pledge brothers and so forth. So I moved from Oklahoma City where I had a nice job and I became, um, um, I went to an institutional broker in Dallas, Texas for two years. And then from that um, situation, they uh, offered me a job in London, England. So here I am, a little Oklahoma boy um, sitting <laughs> in Dallas and I put my hand in the air saying, I'll check it out. And, you know, two weeks later, I'm over there living there. So we moved to London, stayed there for five years. And then they asked me to move to New York. They moved to New York. And we, we lived in Connecticut for nine years. And then um, I said, uh, you know, I can't keep this. We call it the old treadmill in New York, the commuting treadmill. You get up at mm -hmm. 4.30 and you go into Wall Street and you get back on the train at nine o'clock at night. And it's not a very good um, uh, quality of life. So I did that for nine years. But the key element of that is that I was, um, I had a client here in Michigan and the client was quite large. And so we, I would be sort of the quarterback and I'd bring all these analysts and all these specialists uh -huh. out to see the people in at the state capitol in Lansing. And so I'd be out here every three weeks and I got to know Michigan well and uh, ended up um, picking up another couple of clients. And uh, from that, uh, I just decided it's time to make a switch. So um, twisted my wife's arm big time because she didn't want to move. And we had three children, great, uh, grade school children, and we all moved to Michigan 22 years ago. And life has been steadily improving. And now you couldn't get us out of Michigan. So it's, it's quite a journey we've been on, but it's been uh, quite delightful. And uh, now two of the daughters are married. Uh, one is very close to us, I mean, in the house. And so life is pretty good. So um, I feel very blessed, number one, I'm healthy. Um, and this third act, uh, sort of endeavor came out of that. And, you know, from the recovery period, I finally said, well, let's just make this something good. So I started honing this project out and uh, I started uh, putting together the website and had a friend um, offer some help because I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. And so I got a young person to do the website and do my social media. And uh, then I got a podcast producer and you know, we first did blogs or newsletters for two or three months, and then we rolled into the podcast in September. Now we're coming to 2021, and I'm wanted to, as in my words, I want to kick it up a notch. I want to take the third act, what I call the good conversation we started last year, and move it into some meaningful sort of difference for people that are, I say, walking the talk every day. They're really out there in our communities helping the unfortunate that uh, either don't have food, don't have uh, housing, clothing, the whole bit. We're talking about the lowest of the low that fall under the cracks of the big organizations. So um, I've been really blessed to experience a lot of that uh, through a volunteer perspective, as well as these podcast guests that come on uh, the podcast and share their story. And I really want to amplify that. And now I want to make I help them make a difference so that we can raise some dollars and help their cause so that we can help more people. So long wow. story short, that's kind of the five minute version. And so the third act 
says that there was a first and a second act. Well, my it's my third act just from the standpoint of trying to make something really positive out of the final third of my life. That's kind of the genesis of, of that. But as I think about it, I just wrote this. And so I, it's my own mind thing. But I think it kind of has a, um, I call it a triple entendre aspect to it, meaning certainly it's a third act for me to find fulfillment and purpose in my life. I, I've called it building a purpose, building a purpose for me, building a purpose for the third act community as I continue to get more people to read and listen to the podcast. And then finally, most importantly, uh, the the improvement and the increasing impact we can have with for quality people that are helping people throughout the country. It doesn't have to be in Michigan, a lot of them are, but some in Texas, some in Oklahoma, uh, we're, hope, we're helping right now. And so I want to make this, um, I guess you'd say a, a movement if we can garner the awareness and the attention and get people to sort of, I call it lock arms and, and do this sure. together. So that's kind so of. So is Third Act, is it formed as like a, a nonprofit organization? Not today. Oh, no. Not today. We're um, experimenting um, uh-huh. with a friend in, in Austin I was telling you about, but we're talking about uh, the structure of that. Uh, we may do an LLC. We may do just um, 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 uh, some other sort of more simplified sort of structure, financial structure, or maybe I'm just um, sort of highlighting uh, the cause and right. the donors, if they choose to donate, will go directly to the outfit if they if they are a charitable organization. So it makes uh, that pretty easy. But we're, we are talking and experimenting with different sorts of avenues for financial backing, for sure. But the main thing is matching resources with need. Yes. And, yes. and just, let's just get into the trenches. Let's get the money where it needs to go or That's get right. the support where it needs That's to right. go. I, wow. Yeah, I have a great story, if you'll allow me right now. Please, but, um, yes. Because uh-huh. I, I, I'm living it right now. I just wrote the, um, uh, the blog for it. I did a podcast Friday with... A young lady I've been working with since the last September. Um, she is just, uh, I don't know, I, the energizers are bunny times 10 plus <laughs> at the same time, she has this gigantic heart, but also she has this ability to get volunteers to sign up for everything. So, I mean, oh, I'm serious from last March when she started uh, food delivery and furniture delivery to these um, families in Pontiac, Michigan, which is a less fortunate uh, community. We've been helping her and uh, it's just grown and grown and grown. We did a big Christmas program. We helped 175 families, which some families had seven people in the family, receive tailored Christmas gifts for each fa- family member with this gigantic spreadsheet. And then we had to, we had you know, everyone delivering the gifts into Pontiac. It was really a, a, a fun event and everyone felt good about that. But now she has a new program, which I'm really psyched about and I want to get people to uh, to help out. It's a what she calls a book buddy program. And what it is going to do, it's going to take kids, high school kids and volunteers, adults out of, say, Bloomfield Hills, Birmingham, the suburbia of Detroit, uh-huh. And they're going to read bedtime stories to children, third and fourth graders in Pontiac. Uh, the kids in Pontiac are going to get new pajamas, which they don't have. And they're going to get uh, hot chocolate, which is a little enticement. But they're going to get six books that the reader is going to read to them. They're going to be uh, on uh, Google Meet is the way they're going to do it, just like a Zoom call. Okay. And it's going to be really, really cool. And so um, I'm really charged up about it because I'm really uh, – enthusiastic about helping anything in the educational field, particularly with low income and uh, people that are really in need. So this hits the button really good for me. Well, so let me ask this, uh, just making sure I understand. So somebody in one town is going to connect with families in another town or another place. No, it's, 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 it's individual one... to individual. So individual. Okay. This is, this is so cool. The way this started, um, there's a, um, um, uh, a school in, in the area, Bloomfield Hills, called Sacred Heart, and uh, a teacher friend of my friend said, yeah, I'm all in, and she started talking to her high school kids, and she had 25 kids say, I'm in, I, I want to do this, and so it's just a beautiful thing that these high school kids from, let's be honest, 
well-to-do families, they want to give back. They want to participate. And this whole pandemic sort of shutdown has prevented them from doing that. Mm -hmm. So this is a way for them to get involved. And they're on their computer. Uh, the child in Pontiac is on his computer. Uh, so the Google, Google Meets just like a Zoom call. And so they'll be reading the one in um, Bloomfield Hills, be reading the book and the one the child in Pontiac will be listening. And uh, there's a little bit of a promotion. You know, you read six books and s some good things happen sort of thing. So it's a program that can't expand, which is great. We think that uh, through our contacts with the uh, uh, Pontiac uh, sort of public schools, there could be over 5,000 kids that could uh, uh, use this. So it could really be uh, a neat, neat program that we could really uh, expand and um, make it useful. So basically, short story, I challenged my community to get involved this week, and that's going to come out Friday. And I did the podcast with Kimber, Kimber Bishop Yankee, who is the person that created this. And I hope that uh, we get some commitment. I certainly committed, my wife and I committed, and we want others to join this uh, effort, so. Wow, that is so powerful because, I mean, personally, you know, I've not had my own children, but I've watched the neighbor kids grow up since they were three, four months old. Right. And they used to come over and stay. And I mean, and so I've had my first family, surrogate family, so to speak. Sure. But COVID hit and, you know, we're touching hands through the glass, you know, and it just breaks my heart. And never did I even uh, it occur to me that we could get on to FaceTime, you know, just across the street and right. do that. We, right. we, we've talked that way. But, uh, wow, it's powerful for both. I mean, the kids love it, and I know it, it fills my heart. Exactly. And that's my point or my hope. My hope is that, Others that hear Kimber talk about it on the podcast and read my little uh, sort of challenge will say, shoot, yeah, I'm all in. I'm in. I'll throw in some dollars to help that cause and we can raise some money, which allows us to buy the books, which allows us to add more kids. And so it could be a beautiful thing. We have um, she has uh, some pretty um, uh, good goals. And so I want her to attain those and I'm going to do everything I can to help her. So the person who volunteers to read, how would you characterize that person? You know, I'm a, I'm just learning about it. So yeah, okay. I think it's going to be, uh, it could be anyone's of our yeah. children, to be honest. There's uh, something it, inside that is touching in them. Yes. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's the, the great part about it from my perspective is that they already had this snack. I mean, everyone that, that's lived through this pandemic knows what the situation is. And so if you're, I'll use the, my word, if you're captive in your house and you can't, you know, go out with your friends and you're tired of playing games and TV. And so how do you get involved? You can see what's going on in the world. There's this whole inequity between those that are being left out and those that are doing well. And so my whole approach is to really start, try to help those that are being left out of this, this um, uh, economic, uh, sort of situation where we find ourselves. And so these children of parents are seeing the same thing. So they want to get involved. So I think it's uh, really, um, it's heart, it's heartening for me to hear that. And it is too, that they were so spontaneous to, to sign up. That's the cool part. You know, I, I, what I'm learning in my search for the new compassionate male is that there really is a, a live spark of compassion within every person. We may not realize that that's what it is. And a lot of, you know, most of us guys have got some level of feeling that's shut down by the patriarchy, right? And yet that burn is there. And once we realize what that is and are able to unleash it, then, then we're, I am more of a more complete person in that way. I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've said this to um, anyone that wants to listen to it, actually. But every time I have a great phone conversation with someone new, every time I have a podcast with someone that gives me another great story and inspirational way to contribute to their cause, it, it is so energizing. It is so energizing. Yeah. And uh, it gives me the juice, if you will, to make that next call or find that next project or find that next uh, uh, person because they're all over the place. They're all over the place. People are 
are the, the kindness that's out there is tremendous. And I also know that there's also um, a willingness to participate from the standpoint of volunteers and donors if you make that connection. And so my, my hope is I can make the connection through my guests and through my newsletters to get people to, um, to join. I say, join the effort is the, yeah. you know, I, I can do it, but it'd be, it's going to be more effective and it's going to help the cause more if I can get 10 people, 20 people, hundred people to join in the effort. And that's my uh, hope this year. Well, you know, you, you were touching on, you know, the, us being all confined and so forth. And, and I know with, with my men's circle, you know, it's almost a lot of times we, I see fellows that are, you know, this helpless, hopeless. I can't do anything to change the world. Who am I, you know? And I'm reminded of the, the old story of the young fellow on the beach. He's found all these starfish and he's tossing them out one at a time. And the old man comes up to him and you know what he says, you know, son, you can't make a difference here. And the little boy picks up another one. And he tosses it out. And he said, I made a difference to that one. Yeah, that's right. You know, and that's, I think, the spark that, that, that these people that are volunteering is this feeling of being helpless, hopeless, because this pandemic and all that's going on is so huge. But here's a place where I can make a difference to that one. That's exactly And right. all that energy can come out. That's exactly right. That's exactly oh, that's right. wonderful. Now, that's just one program. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got I got eight or 10 uh, there. I mean, it, that's the exciting part for me. And that's gives me the energy to, to uh, uh, really reach higher, as I say it, or try to step it up this year and, and uh, be more meaningful to more organizations. That's my hope. And so, uh, you know, I had a number, of, I, I don't want to sing out anyone because there's many, but uh -huh. I, I have retired guys that are building beds for kids in Pontiac. I have a guy that's repairing bikes for kids that's retired. Um, I talked to a gentleman who's 35 in uh, San Antonio that has this adaptable bike bike program for challenged youth that that need help with that. And it's he's established, he's growing that into a mentoring program that's beautiful. So there are stories all over the country, and um, I, I know I'm just scratching the surface, but uh, if I can get um, a handful of these that can really uh, invite or grab people and bring in more participation, then I think we're going to have a great year. So that's my hope. And that's my, my, my aspiration as I look out into, uh, 2021. Well, I, I hold that with you and what strikes me is your energy and your energy of do. And this other person you were describing how her, you know, the energizer bunny, I believe people, are, are starved for that kind of I, I that think, leadership. You know, I think I was, I'll say this. I think I was, I think, you know, my life was and is pretty good. I mean, I have my investment business, you know, I have my friends here play golf on the weekends, do the business Monday through Friday. Life was okay, but I didn't really have that connection or that give back possibility until I got sick and you're getting sick and you're in your <laughs> I tell you, you're in your bedroom for two months. You think about a lot of stuff. It yeah. really, it really has a, um, a, uh, I don't know, a mind bender for you. So at least what it did for me. So yeah, that was the genesis of this whole thing, which now I'm thankful for, to be honest. I so relate to that. Um, you know, there was a time in my life when things were very dark and I reached the point where it was, you know, the age old question, who am I, why am I here and where am I going? And I knew that I couldn't answer that question. And that was what was the emptiness that I had. Right. And it took, took me skinning my, my chin on the asphalt enough times to f finally begin to see. And, you know, it was funny because I, I, had a hiatus from organized religion for 20 years. And I started going back to, uh, I, I went to a unity church kind of in the new thought tradition. Right, right, right. And, uh, it, you know, and I had my journal and I mind map and, you know, and I'm processing and everybody's healing from something in there. And one day our, our minister 
said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to build a condo there. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. And I just howled laughing. And of course, everybody looked at me, you know, but it was like, wow, I could have had a V8. <laughs> right, right. But it was a, it was a, it was a, a humorous twist on a Bible verse that got through to me that said, Clay, you have choice. Yes. yes. You can choose to be here. Yes. And, and you can choose to make a different decision and move on. And that's, I, I, that's kind of, I think, perhaps what maybe would come to you along the way. Yeah, I, there's, there's definitely a spiritual uh, aspect to it that I'm still, um, um, I, I say, walking with. I don't know exactly how that's all going to play out. I mean, I, I think of myself as spiritual. I think of myself, mm-hmm. I mean, two of my guests have been pastors. So I think that says something with that. And I, I do... I do pray and I do think um, um, I, I do have a strong uh, disposition for mission and giving back yes. to others. And I have, you know, since I can remember, but, but this is different. This is, um, you know, this is all weekends and this is, you know, after I go home at five o'clock at night, this is what I'm consumed with. So it's taken on a bigger portion of my uh, free time for sure, which is great because as I say, I have a purpose. It's building a purpose for me. And if I can build a purpose for me, then I can build a purpose hopefully for others. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, Victor Frankel and, uh, you know, what he witnessed during the Holocaust and, and so forth. And his, it always comes back to me at times. It was, uh, he who has a why to live, can endure almost anyhow. And it's the why that is so, so, so important to me. And, uh, and to be on the journey, I, you know, I'm still looking for my why, (laughs) but I'm on the right, I'm in the, I'm heading in the right direction. No, you definitely are. And it keeps, it gets a little clearing, a little adjust here, a little adjust there, but, but to be on that, uh, on a, on a path of something greater than oneself. Right. To me, that's, that well, spirituality. That's, 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 that's the, what it's all about. I'm, I'm with you hundred percent on that one. So for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you've got three parts to your program, illumination, compassion, inspiration. Can you talk about those a little bit? Well, the, um, yeah, it, it's uh, sort of all wraps into my thinking of trying to promote good organizations or individuals that are doing great things in our communities. So I've done everything from doing a newsletter from simple stuff, going to our uh, little deli next door and our hairdresser, my dry cleaners and interviewing them in the depths of the uh, pandemic and saying, how are you getting through this? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Are you getting your... PPE loan or you didn't and and they were they were shut down they were shut down and you know these are small businesses that need you know daily Mm -hmm. customers um I'm sure they're the same in Austin um but but that's one aspect of it then I started interviewing and talking to bigger organizations or charitable organizations like Forgotten Harvest is big in our part of the world and they take a lot of food that is both left over and uh, um, still uh, quite good. Mm-hmm. And they give it out to a lot of uh, charitable sorts of uh, uh, endeavors. But since the, when the uh, pandemic hit, they just completely changed their mission and started these kiosks all around Metro Detroit. I think they had 17 or 20 of them. And, and they are basically food banks, portable po- food banks for lack of a definition. And so they get volunteers and they get everyone to donate, uh, uh, get a lot of donations of food. And it was a beautiful thing and it's still ongoing. Um, I'm helping the friend I mentioned, Kimber, that's doing the book buddy program. She also helps a food delivery drive and a furniture drive, which I'm helping with that. And so we're doing our thing in Pontiac and other people are doing things in other parts of Metro Detroit. And you know, the volunteer aspect is one where I know some people cannot do it for physical reasons and also for health reasons. But if you can do it, if you can do it, it is a light that turns on that you'll never forget. Um, yeah. At least in my 
you know, a short witness of this. So, you know, going into uh, houses with three mattresses on the on the floor that you know five or six or seven people, kids and adults are sleeping there. You go into a trailer and uh, a gentleman doesn't have any heat and he's been that way for three months and he's he's getting his heat from a portable heater from a neighbor that is running an extension cord to his trailer. I mean, these people, what I really wanted to initially do is promote individuals and organizations that are making a difference below the charitable organization sort of floor. These are people that are falling below the cracks, I call it. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, illumination piece is really just the spotlight in the podcast and, and bringing more awareness to it. And then the inspiration piece is is now what's going to be in 2021 is getting more people involved and and making a difference and that means increasing the impact helping to generate more dollars donated dollars to a cause that's really um, uh, worthwhile and if i can pull all that together then we're going to make a difference and so that's the hope this year and your focus is is just is within the city no absolutely not um i don't know if you heard before but i was I've talked to um, a lady in Oklahoma City that's doing uh, oh, okay. rebuilding OKC, um, and so she's helping a lot of uh, older people that are getting their houses fixed up and getting ramps built in their homes, and she's dynamite. I did a podcast with her. I did a podcast with a gentleman in San Antonio, Texas, that is doing these adaptable bikes for um, kids mm -hmm. uh, that are physically um, challenged. And so there's a number of uh, programs that I've highlighted. So no, it doesn't doesn't have to be Michigan, doesn't have to be Pontiac. I'm, those are just examples recently that I've been involved with. So you know that's one of the neat things about having a podcast, and you meeting so many interesting people. I, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to meet and get involved with the uh, Charter for Compassion, Karen Armstrong's organization, and networked all around the world and come in contact with so many fascinating people doing so much good. And as you're talking, I'm reeling off my mind. I need to introduce you to this person, this person, oh, this person, this person. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So on, I, on. that's, that's one way I think I can help, you know, support lifting. That would be great. I, mean, I, I made this, I made this up, but it, it, it can be true. But I said, um, I did, I used, Austin, as my example, I said, I'd love to have a project in Austin where um, I can highlight that to the third act community and we can go down there and make a difference in a, I don't know, a drive, a Special Olympics, you name the cause that we can get involved with and really make a difference. And that, you know, more people, more of my friends, girls, doesn't have to be guys, anyone can come down and join the effort. And then hopefully we can get more uh, awareness and therefore more uh, help into that cause and, and maybe take on a hands-on sort of approach. So I'm totally open to anything, but I want to be able to have little, my, my efforts make a difference in a organization. If I, you know, I love the Red Cross and I love a lot of the big organizations, but um, I want to help those that the Red Cross is not touching. I want to help those that, the food bank in Pontiac is not touching. There's people underneath that blanket right. that don't have, they don't, don't have a car. They don't have uh, the ability to, um, they don't speak English, that they feel very intimidated about the whole situation. They find, find themselves and they need help. They need food. They need, um, you know, shoes. They need basic stuff that we in Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills take for granted. And that's another thing that's been a, mind blower for me although you know it you know it in austin i'm sure it's the same thing in austin dallas wherever but these communities are 15 20 minutes from where i live no, and right. these people are struggling to survive and if we can help in any way to make their life a little bit better through either some furniture that's donated from a family in bloomfield hills that goes mm -hmm. to pontiac or food delivery or turning on the heat or paying the electric bill for a guy in a trailer that's been fro been didn't have electricity for three months. That is meaningful stuff. And that gives me the encouragement and the energy to go to the next project. So if somebody wants to 
chip in with you. They want to, you know, sign up beside you and, and, and work beside you or support you in some fashion. What's the best way for them to contact? The easiest you? way to do it is to sign up um, through the, through my website to the newsletter, uh, the newsletter. Well, actually the website has both the podcast and the newsletters uh, mm -hmm. under separate tabs so they can find both but it is wearethirdact.com. Wearethirdact.com, and they can find it quickly. Sign up. There's a button for uh, signing up for the newsletter, and then there's an easy tab to go through all the podcasts from the very beginning. And okay, so let me clarify. And, and is yep. it we are third act? Is that all spelled out in words? It's all one. Yeah, all one. All, all one. Yeah. Okay. So there's and no third is third is T H I R D. We okay. are thirdact.com. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll certainly put that, you know, That'd here on the screen and, and I'll put that in the, in the text, uh, where I post it. I'm certainly going to be posting it on my website. Oh, thank you. And I'll put you contact. I'll put the website address there That'd be great. and, That'd be great. uh, to make sure people can contact you. Yep. Wow. Coming back from COVID and doing such great things. That's so powerful. Well, it's um, it's powerful for me too. So I, yes, you know, it is. Yeah. It is. It is. And it, uh, I think even uh, my friends that know me from around here, um, they see a difference. I mean, we haven't been able to play golf, but at the same time, <laughs> I think the commentary I get, the little different uh, yeah. conversations and texts and emails, people recognize that it's making a difference for me and. You know, if, if I can encourage more people to join in, uh, then that's a good thing, too. So. Well, I I want to say this. First, I would love for you to come back. I'd love to get a progress report here down the road. And uh, is there anything in the last couple of minutes here that, that we've not touched on that, that you would like to share? No, I, th I think just uh, if anyone has any interest in your um, community to check it out, check us out. Mm -hmm. Just do so. We're also on LinkedIn. At least Roger Steed is on LinkedIn. And you can, I put out some of my blogs and newsletters and podcast links on that. And we're also on Instagram. So they can okay. find We Are Third Act on Instagram as well as LinkedIn. Facebook? I'm not a Facebook guy. Okay. So Instagram is where to go. Instagram and LinkedIn. And okay. LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Roger, it's been a real pleasure meeting you and visiting with you today. That's a wrap for now. We'll see you next time in search of the new compassionate male. Powerful. <laughs> I loved our conversation. Thanks, There's got to be a good news network. <laughs> well, maybe that's what you should start. Yeah. Well, I tell you one thing. I tell you one thing is I've, I've had this vision of the of the compassionate male podcasting network. Hey, and, count me in. Count and every me in. all the podcasters, we all know each other. And I say, hey, you need to get this guy into your show and vice versa. I I would be all in on that for sure. And uh because I really do believe that with all the change that's happening right now, the new compassionate male really is emerging as a new archetype. You know, it's not this it's you know, I was talking to somebody when they were talking about, well, you know, you're talking about the the new age guys in the sixties and seventies that, you know, they were all softened in their hearts and stuff. And I said, no, that was a pendulum swing. What we're talking about now is an integration of head and heart so that we can really fully show up. Yeah. You're onto something. I mean, it's, um, it's happening. It's happening. And it, it catches people at different times in their life and their, uh, yeah. their maturity cycle, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that's why I say, even though it wasn't fun, I think the COVID illness was a great thing for me personally. I mean, I don't know what it's going to lead to, but I know it's not going to be a bad thing. It's going to be, I mean, I know my head and my head is, okay, I've done this. Can I do 10X? So, you know, we'll see where it goes.